Hello, my name is Sin Bagley, and I am reading The Skylark of Space by E.E. E. Duck Smith and Lee Hawkins Garby, Chapter 10. Chapter 10, The Rescue. Seaton and Crane drove the Skylark in the direction indicated by the unwavering object compass with the greatest acceleration they could stand, each man taking a 12-hour watch at the instrument board. Now, indeed, did the Skylark justify the faith of our builders and the two inventors with an exultant certainty of their success, flew out beyond man's wildest imaginings. Had it not been for the haunting fear for Dorothy's safety, the journey would have been one of pure triumph, and even the anxiety did not prevent a profound joy in the enterprise. Sorry about that bang. It came from my neighbor across the way. So... Let's get back to the story. If that misguided mutt thinks he can pull off a stunt like that and get away with it, he's got another think coming, asserted Seaton, after making a reading on another car after several days of the flight. He went off half cocked this time for sure, and we've got him foul. We'd better put on some negative pretty soon, hadn't we, Mart? Only a little over a hundred light years now. <clears throat> Crane nodded agreement, and Seaton continued. It'll take as long to stop, of course, as it has taken to get out here. And if we ram them, good night. Let's figure it out as nearly as we can. They calculated their own speed and that of the other vessel as shown by various readings taken and applied just enough negative acceleration to slow the Skylark down to the speed of the other space car when they should come up to it. They smiled at each other in recognition of the perfect working of the mechanism when the huge vessel had spun with a sickening lurch through a complete direction that seemed to that to them seemed down, but with a constantly diminishing velocity, even though they seemed to be still going up with an increasing speed. Until near the end of the calculated time, the two took turns as before, but as the time of meeting drew near, both men were on the alert, taking readings on the object compass every few minutes. Finally, Crane announced, We're almost on them, Dick. They're so close that it's almost impossible to time the needle less than 10,000 miles. Satan gradually increased the retarding force until the needle showed that they were very close to the other vessel and maintaining a constant distance from it. He then shut off the power and both men hurried to the bottom windows to search for the fleeing ship with their powerful night glasses. They looked at each other in amazement as they felt themselves falling almost directly downward with an astounding acceleration. What do you make of it, Dick? asked Crane calmly as he brought his glasses to his eyes and stared out into the black heavens studded with multitudes of brilliant and unfamiliar stars. I don't make it at all, Mart. By the feel, I should say we were falling towards something that would make our earth look like a pinhead. I remember now that I noticed that the bus was getting a little out of plumb with the bar all this last watch. I didn't pay much attention to it as I couldn't see anything out of the way. Nothing but a sun could be big enough to raise all this disturbance, and I can't see any close enough to be afraid of, can you? No, and I cannot see the steel space car either. Look sharp. Of course, Seaton continued to argue as he peered out into the night. It is theoretically possible that a heavenly body can exist large enough so that it would exert even this much force and still appear no larger than an ordinary star. But I don't believe it is probable. Give me three or four minutes of visual angle and I'll believe anything. But none of these stars are big enough to have any visual angle at all. There's at least half a degree of visual angle, broke in his friend intensely. Just to the right of that constellation that looks so much like a question mark. It is not bright but dark. Like a very dark moon. Barely perceptible. Seaton pointed his glass eagerly at the direction indicated. Great cat, he ejaculated. I'll say that some moon. Wouldn't that rattle your slats? And that's Duchesne's bus nut, too, on the right edge of it. Get it? As they stood up, Seaton's mood turned to one of deadly earnestness, and a grave look came over Crane's face as the seriousness of their situation dawned upon them. Trained mathematicians both, they knew instantly that the unknown world was of inconceivable mass and that their chance of escape was none too good. Even should they abandon the other craft to its fate, Seaton stared at Crane, his fists clenched in drops of perspiration. 
standing on his forehead. Suddenly, with an agony in his eyes and his voice, he spoke. Mighty slim chance of getting away if we go through with it, old man. Hate like the devil. Have no right to ask you to throw yourself away, too. Enough of that, Dick. You had nothing to do with my coming. You could not have kept me away. We will see it through. Their hands met in a fierce clasp. Clasp, broken by Seton as he jumped to the levers with an intense, well, let's get busy. In a few minutes, they had reduced the distance until they could plainly see that the other vessel, a small black circle against the faintly luminous disk. As it leaped into the clear relief in the beam of his powerful searchlight, Seton focused the great attractor upon the fugitive car and threw in the lever which released the force of that mighty magnet, while Crane attracted the attention of the vessel's occupants by means of a momentary burst of solid machine gun bullets, which he knew would glance harmlessly off the steel hull. After an interminable silence, Duchesne threw, drew himself out of the seat. He took a long inhalation, deposited the butt of his cigarette safe carefully in the ashtray, and made his way to his room. He returned with three heavy fur suits, provided with air hel helmets, two of which he handed to the girls, who were bundled in a seat with their arms around each other. These suits was armor designed by Crane for using and exploring the vacuum and intense cold of dead worlds. Airtight, braced with fine steel netting, and supplied with air at a normal pressure from small tanks by automatic valves, they made their wearers independent of surrounding conditions of pressure and temperature. The next thing to do, Duchesne stated calmly, is to get the copper off the outside of the ship. That is the last resort, as it robs us of our only safeguard against meteorites. But this is the time for last resort measures. I'm going after that copper, but put these suits on, as our air will leave as soon as I open the door, and practically an absolute vacuum and equally absolute zero will come in. As he spoke, the ship was enveloped in a blinding glare, and they were thrown flat as the vessel slowed down in a terrific fall. The thought flashed across Duchesne's mind that they had already entered the atmosphere of the monster globe and were being slowed down and set afire by its friction, but he dismissed it as quickly as it had come. The light in the case would be the green of copper, not this bluish white. His first thought was that there had been a collision of meteors in the neighborhood and that their retardation was due to the outer coating. While their thoughts were flickering through his mind, they heard an insistent metallic tapping which Duchesne recognized instantly. A machine gun, he blurted in, in amazement. How in? It's Dick, screamed Dorothy with flashing eyes. He's found it just as I knew he would. You couldn't beat Dick and Martin in a thousand years. The tension in which they had been laboring so long suddenly released. The two girls locked their arms around each other in a half hysterical outburst of relief. Margaret's meaningless words and Dorothy's incoherent praises of her lover and Crane mingled with their racking sobs as each forgot to recover self-possession. Duchesne had instantly mounted to the upper window. Throwing back the cover, he flashed his torch rapidly. The glare of the searchlight was snuffed out, and he saw a flashing light spelling out in dots and dashes. Can you read Morse? Yes, he signaled back. Power gone, drifting into. We know it. Will you resist? No. Have you fur pressure suits? Yes. Put them on. Shut off your outer coating. We'll touch... So your upper door against our lower. Open, transfer quick. Okay. Hastily returning to the main compartment, he briefly informed the girls as to what had happened. All three donned the suits and stationed themselves at the upper opening. Rapidly, but with unerring precision, the two ships were brought into place and held together by the attractor. As the doors were opened, there was a screaming hiss as the air of the vessel escaped through the narrow crack between them. The passengers saw the moisture in the air turn into snow and saw the air itself first liquefy and then freeze into a solid coating upon the metal around the orifices of the touch of the frightful cold outside. The absolute zero of interstellar space, about 460 degrees below zero in the everyday scale of temperature. The moisture of their breath condensed upon the inside of the double glasses of their helmets, rendering sight useless. Dorothy pushed the other girl ahead of her. Duchesne squeezed her and tossed her 
lightly through the doorway in such a manner that she could not touch the metal, which would have frozen instantly anything coming into contact with it. Seaton was ready. Feeling a woman's slender form in his arm, he crushed her to him in his mighty embrace and was astonished to feel movements of resistance and to hear a strange girlish voice cried out, Don't! It's me! Dorothy's next! Releasing her abruptly, he paused past her onto Martin and turned just in time to catch his sweetheart, who, knowing that he would be there and recognizing his powerful arms at the first touch, returned his embrace with fierce intensity, which even he had never suspected that she could exert. They stood motionless, locked in each other's arms, while Duchesne dove through the opening and snapped the door shut behind them. The air pressure and temperature back to normal, the cumbersome suits were hastily removed, and Seaton's lips met Dorothy's in a long, clinging caress. Duchesne's cold and incisive voice broke the silence. Every second counts, I would suggest that we go somewhere. Just a minute, snapped Crane. Dick, what shall we do with this murderer? Seaton had forgotten Duchesne utterly in the joy of holding his sweetheart in his arms. But at his friend's words, he, f- he faced about, and his face grew stern. By rights, we ought to chuck him back into his own tub and let him go to the devil, he said savagely, doubling his fist and turning swiftly. No, no, Dick remonstrated Dorothy, seeing, seizing his arm. He treated us very well, and saved my life once. Anyway, you mustn't kill him. No, I suppose not, grudgingly assented her lover. And I won't either, unless he gives me at least half an excuse. We might iron him to a pose, suggested Crane doubtfully. I think there's a better way, replied Seaton. He may be able to work his way. His brain hits on all twelve, and he's strong as a bull. Our chance of getting back isn't a certainty, as you know. He turned to Duchesne. I've heard that your word is good. It has never been broken. Will you give your word to act as one of the party for the good of us all if we don't iron you? Yes, until we get back to Earth. Provide, of course, that I reserve the right to escape at any time between now and then if I wish to, and can do so without injuring the vessel or any member of the party in any way. Agreed. Let's get busy. We're altogether too close to that dud there to suit me. Sit tight, everybody. We're on our way, he cried as he turned to the board, applied one notch of power, then shut off the attractor. The skylark slowed down a trifle in its mad fall. The other vessel continued on its way, a helpless bulk manned by a corpse, falling to destruction upon the bleak waste of a desert world. Hold on, said Duchesne sharply. Your power is the same as mine was in proportion to your mass, isn't it? Yes. Then our goose is cooked. I couldn't pull away from it with everything I had. Couldn't even swing out enough to make an orbit, either hyperbolic or elliptical around it. With a reserve bar, you'll be able to make an orbit, but you can't get away from it. Thanks for the dope. That saves our wasting some effort. Our power plant can be doubled up in emergency thanks to Martin's cautious old bean. We'll simply double her up and get away from here. There is one thing we didn't consider quite enough, said Crane thoughtfully. I started to faint back there before the full power of even one motor was in use. With the motor doubled, each of us will be held down by a force of many tons. We would all be helpless. Yes, added Dorothy, with foreboding in her eyes. We were all unconscious on the way out except Dr. Duchesne. Well, then Blackie and I, as the huskiest members of the party, will give her the juice until one of us is left with his eyes open. If that's not enough to pull us clear, we'll have to give her the whole works and let her ramble her by herself after we all go out. How about it, Blackie? Unconsciously falling into the old bureau nickname. Do you think we can make it stop at unconsciousness with double power on? Do you stay and study the two girls carefully? Hmm. <clears throat> with oxygen in the helmets instead of air, we all may be able to stand it. These special cushions keep the body from flattening out as it normally would under such a pressure. The unconsciousness is simply a suffocation caused by the lateral muscles being unable to lift the ribs. In other words, the air pumps aren't strong enough for the added work put upon them. At least, we stand a chance this way. We may live through the pressure while we are pulling away, and we certainly shall die if we don't pull away. Hmm. <clears throat> After a brief consultation, the men set to work with furious haste. While Crane placed extra bars in each of the motors, and Duchesne made careful observation upon the apparent size of the now plainly visible world to 
toward which they were being drawn so irresistibly. Seaton connected the helmets with the air and oxygen tanks through a valve upon the board by means of which he could change at will the oxygen content of the air they breathed. He then placed the strange girl who seemed dazed by the frightful sensation of their never-ending fall upon one of the seats, fitted the cumbersome helmet upon her head, strapped her carefully into place, and turned to Dorothy. In an instant they were in each other's arms. He felt her labor breathing and the wild beating of her heart pressed so close to his and saw the fear of the unknown in the violet depths of her eyes, but she looked at him unflinchingly. Dick, sweetheart, if this is a goodbye, he managed. He interrupted her with a kiss. It isn't a goodbye yet, Dotty mine. This is merely a trial effort to see what we will have to do to get away. Next time will be the time to worry. I'm not worried, really, but in case you see, I we... The gray eyes softened and misted over as he pressed his cheek to hers. I understand, sweetheart, he whispered. This is not goodbye, but if we don't pull through, we'll go together, and that's what we both want. As Crane and Duchesne finished their task, Seaton fitted his sweetheart's helmet, placed her tenderly upon the seat, buckled the heavy restraining straps about her slender body, and donned his own helmet. He took his place at the main instrument board, Duchesne stationing himself at the other. Where did you read on it, Blackie? asked Seaton. Two degrees, one minute, twelve seconds diameter, replied Duchesne. All together too close for comfort. How shall we apply the power? One of us must stay awake or we'll go on as long as the bars last. You put on one notch, then I'll put on one. We can feel the bus jump with each notch. We'll keep it up until one of us is so far gone that he can't raise the bar. The one that raises last will have to let the ship run for 30 minutes or an hour, then cut down his power. Then the other fellow will revive and cut his off in an observation. How's that? All right. They took their places, and Seaton felt the vessel slow down in its horrible fall as Duchesne threw his lever into the first notch. He responded instantly by advancing his own, and notch after notch, the power applied to the ship by the now double, doubled motor was rapidly increased. The passengers felt their suits envelop them and began to labor for breath. Seaton slowly turned the mixing valve a little with each advance of his lever until pure oxygen flowed through the pipes. The power levers had moved scarcely half of the range, yet minutes now intervened between each advance instead of seconds, as at the start. As each of the two men were determined that he would be the last advance, the duel continued longer than either would have thought possible. Seaton made what he thought his final effort and waited only to feel after a few minutes the upward surge telling him that Duchesne was still able to move his lever. His brain reeled. His arm seemed paralyzed by his own enormous weight and felt as though the rolling, tele the rolling table upon which it rested and the supporting framework were so immovably welded together that it was impossible to move it even the quarter inch necessary to operate the ratchet lever. He could not move his body, which was oppressed by a sickening weight. His utmost efforts to breathe forced only a little of the life-giving oxygen into his lungs, which smarted painfully at the touch of the undiluted gas. He felt that he could not long retain consciousness under such conditions. Nevertheless, he summoned all of his strength and advanced the lever one more notch. He stared at the clock face above his head, knowing that if Duchesne could advance his lever again, he would lose con unconsciousness and be beaten. Minute after minute went by, however, and the acceleration of the ship remained constant. Seaton, knowing that he was in the sole control of the power plant, fought to retain possession of his faculties, while the hands of the clock told off the interminable minutes. After an eternity of time, an hour had passed, and Seaton attempted to cut his parrot, only to find with horror that the long strain so weakened him that he could not reverse the ratchet. He was still able, however, to give the liver the backward jerk, which disconnected the disconnected the wires completely, and the safety straps creaked with sudden stress as half the power instantly shut off. The sudden release springs tried to hurl five bodies against the ceiling. After a few minutes, Duchesne revived and slowly cut off his power. To the dismay of both men, they were again falling. Duchesne hurried to the lower window to make an observation, remarking, 
You're a better man than I am, Gunga Din. Only because you're so badly bunged up, one more notch would have got my goat, replied Satan frankly as he made his way to Dorothy's side. He noticed as he reached her that Crane removed his helmet and was approaching the other girl. By the time Duchesne had finished the observation, the other passengers had completely recovered, apparently none the worse for their experience. Mm. Did we gain anything? asked Satan eagerly. I make it two, four, thirteen. We've lost about two minutes of arc. How much power do we have on? A little over half. Thirty-two points out of sixty possible. We were still falling pretty fast. We'll have to put on everything we've got. Since neither of us can put it on, we'll have to rig an automatic feed. It'll take time, but it's the only way. The automatic control is already there, put in Crane, for Stelling Seaton's explanation. The only question is whether we will live through it. That is not really a question, since certain death is the only alternative. We must do it. Should be sure months, answered Seaton soberly. Dorothy gratefully nodded assent. What do you fellows think of a little plus pressure on the oxygen? asked Seaton. I think it would help a lot. I think it's a good idea, said Duchesne, and Crane added. Four or five inches of water will be about all the pressure we can stand. Any more might burn our lungs too badly. The pressure apparatus was quickly arranged and the motors filled to capacity with reserve bars enough to last 72 hours. The scientists, having decided they must risk everything on one trial and put in enough, if possible, to pull them clear out of the influence of the center of attraction, as the time lost in slowing up in change bars might well mean the difference between success and failure. Where they might lie at the end of the well dash for safety, how they were to retrace their way with their depleted supply of copper, what other dangers of dead star, planet, or sun lay in their path, all these were terrifying questions that had to be ignored. Duchesne was the only member of the party who actually felt any calmness. The quiet of the others expressing their courage and facing fear, life seemed very sweet and desirable to them. The distance, earth, a very paradise. Though Dorothy's mind flashed the vision she had built up during her long sweet hours, visions of a long life with Seton, as she breathed an inaudible prayer, she glanced up and saw Seton standing beside her, gazing down upon her with his very soul in his eyes. Never would she forget the expression upon his face. Even in that crucial hour, his great love for her overshadowed every other feeling, and no thought of self was in his mind. His care was all for her. There was a long farewell caress. Both knew that would, it might be goodbye, but both were silent as the violet eyes and the gray looked into each other's depths and conveyed messages far beyond the power of words. Once more, he adjusted her helmet and strapped her into place. As Crane had, in the meantime, cared for the other girl, the men again took their places, and Seaton started the motor, which automatically advanced the speed levers one notch every five seconds, until the full power of both motors were exerted. As the power was increased, he turned the valve as before until the helmets were filled with pure oxygen under a pressure of five inches of water. Margaret Spencer, weakened by her imprisonment, was the first to lose consciousness, and soon afterward Dorothy felt her senses leave her. <clears throat> A half minute, in the course of, of which six mighty surges were felt, as more of the power of the double motor was released, and Crane had gone, calmly analyzing his sensations to the last. After a time, Duchesne also left into unconsciousness, making no particular effort to avoid it, as he knew that the involuntary muscles would function quite as well without the direction of the will. Seaton, although he knew it was useless, fought to keep his senses as long as possible, counting the impulses he felt as the levers were advanced. Thirty-two, he felt exactly as he had before when he advanced the lever for the last time. Thirty-three, a giant hand shut off his breath completely, although he was fighting to his utmost for air, an intolerable weight rested upon his eyeballs, forcing them backward into his head. The universe whirled about him in dizzy circles, orange and black, and green stars flashed before his bursting eyes. 34. The stars became more brilliant and of more variegated 
variegated colors, and a giant pen dipped in the fire was writing equations and mathematical chemical symbols upon his quivering brain. He joined the circling universe which he had hitherto kept away from him by main strength and whirled about his own body, tracing a logarithmic spiral with infinite velocity, leaving his body an infinite distance behind. 35. The stars in the fiery pen exploded in a wild coruscation of searing, blinding light, and he plunged from his spiral into the black abyss. In spite of the terrific stress put upon the machine, every part functioned perfectly, and soon after Satan had lost unconsciousness, the vessel began to draw away from the sinister globe. Slowly at first, faster and faster, as more and more of the almost unlimited power of the mighty motor was released. Soon the levers were out to the last notch, and the machine was exerting its maximum effort. One hour, and the observer upon the sky, like would have seen that the apparent size of the massive unknown world was rapidly decreasing. Twenty hours, and it was so far away as to be invisible, though its effect was still great. Forty hours, and the effect was slight. Sixty hours, and the skylark was out of range of the slightest measurable force of the monster it had left. Hurtled onward by the inconceivable power of the unleashed copper demon in its center, the skylark flew through the infinite reaches of interstellar space with unthinkable, almost uncalculable velocity. Beside which the velocity of light was as that of a snail to that of a rifle bullet, a velocity augmented every second by a quantity almost double that of light itself. And that is the end of chapter 10.